Hello, I am Megan Keen, Director of Product Marketing for Adobe Pro Video, and I am so excited for today's event, Getting Into Sundance, a conversation with Kim Yutani, Director of Programming for the Sundance Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kim. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, before we get started, I do want to take care of a few housekeeping things. First of all, I want to remind everyone this is a live stream. We want it to be interactive. We want you to submit questions. We want it to be a conversation between us and Kim, not just me and Kim. Um, so please do put your questions in the chat pod. We will also be recording today's event uh, for on-demand viewing, so be sure to check out uh, the recording after the event as well. And finally, before we get started, I'd love to show a quick video that sort of looks back on the history of Adobe and Sundance over the years. For an independent filmmaker to get into Sundance is a huge thrust. The odds are incredibly long. When I got the phone call that we got in, it was just like shivers down my spine. This is icing on the cake being here, but the real joy of the process is the process itself. The films that come to Sundance are addressing really big issues. The fact that Adobe supports that kind of content and material, it's really important. The dominant thing in the way I think of and develop a film is through editing. I'm addicted to editing. Editing is like playing with the world's greatest video game. I always look at editing as one big puzzle where the pieces are broken or don't always fit. You have to figure out what's the best way to put that puzzle together, not like, what's the puzzle I want? When you can get a scene to come together and sing, it, there's no feeling like that. I feel most comfortable in Premiere. It's less bureaucratic than other softwares. Everything's just become much faster and much simpler. That I think they've really perfected. Premiere Pro is just giving people what they need. Everything works together, and so it just saves time. We cut the film across coasts. I was able to stream my Premiere timeline, and that allowed us to essentially be in the same room together. If you have all of these tools, all you need then is just your story and your voice. The role of good art is to you know, basically feel less alone in the world. If it connects with people, it's the greatest feeling on earth. You watch the thing, hopefully it blows your mind, you stand up, and maybe things are a little bit different. Movies are really the only thing that can still do that. Man, that is so nostalgic for me. Adobe and Sundance have such a long history, and, and it makes me so excited to be back in Park City this year. Um, what are you most looking forward to uh, having the festival back in person? Well, that, that video does kind of make your heart flutter a little bit, just the, the excitement and the energy of audiences back in theaters. I think that's the thing I'm most looking forward to. Um, and just all the different community members, like, you know, we convene so many people, filmmakers, press, industry, cinephiles, who all come to Park City to see this brand new crop of films. So uh, that's what I'm excited about. And also I think that it's, it, there's nothing like being with filmmakers as they see these films, their films world premiere uh, and, and meet audiences. And just the, the beginning of the conversation, I think is, is truly exciting. Yeah, I love that part of the video where they are talking about how exciting it feels when you first get in, find out you've gotten into Sunday. <laughs> it's like, what a feeling. Um, another great byproduct of being away from being in person is uh, the virtual element of the festival that is being retained from the years of the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about um, the virtual part of the festival? Yeah, I mean, because while we are in person again, um, we are retaining uh, the digital aspect of the festival that we've that had kept us alive the last two years. Uh, so halfway through our festival, uh, we'll still be having screenings happening on the ground in Utah, but uh, starting from Tuesday the 24th until the end of the festival, uh, audiences who are not on the mountain can, st can still see uh, our competition films, our next films, and some other, some other surprises online. And uh, we're really looking forward to that conversation happening on that level uh, with, with audiences wherever they might be in the U.S. 
I love that for our audience watching that you don't necessarily have to be in Park City to really experience so much of Sundance. Now, I'd love to talk a little bit about you before we yeah. get into it. Um, you have such a rich background. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into film programming? Um, what brought you to Sundance? Uh, Sundance actually brought me to Sundance. Um, I first went to the festival in the mid 90s. Um, and w when I worked on a, a film called The Doom Generation that it actually ha happens to be playing this this year mm -hmm. too as kind of our, our from the collection screening. Um, and that was, uh, being in Park City for that film I think really hooked me. Um, I think I always cared about independent cinema, and when I saw what independent film uh, meant to festivals and how, once I realized, oh, there's a job that, that somebody is choosing these films that get into the festival, uh, that was always something I really wanted to do. And I started working for other festivals and volunteering, and then, managed to meet the right people at Sundance and, and started my career as, as a shorts programmer at Sundance. So we actually already have a question from the live stream. What does it mean to be the director of programming for Sundance? What is that job? I mean, you know, it's not just you. I know you have a team. So what does the, the team entail, the work that you're doing? <laughs> it's, it's a huge responsibility, I would say. Um, we have 13 programmers who Put, put the feature film programming together. Um, and leading that group of programmers is a huge honor. It's a huge uh, responsibility that I feel every day. Um, but, it, but you're right, it is about, uh, it's a team effort. Um, and each programmer brings their individual yeah, background, their perspective and what they care about to the, to the room. And, uh, I think that our team is built on respect and uh, listening to each other and arguing and also agreeing. And then, uh, and together we, we put together a program every year and, and having a, a very common goal that we all understand um, is, is, I think, truly what drives us and motivates us every year. Now, I know that a lot of our audience today are young aspiring filmmakers, film students. So I'm just gonna go ahead and ask the question that I'm sure is on all of their minds, which is what is your team looking for? When you start out um, programming each year of the festival, what, what are you looking for? Yeah, that's a question we get a lot. <laughs> sure. um, there is no one answer, obviously, but um, you know, I think, I think that we are, we are looking for fresh perspectives. We're looking for what an individual filmmaker brings to a project. And, uh, and we come to the, pro the process with open minds. Um, that's what we have to do. We can't possibly uh, expect a, a film to be a certain way, but, um, but the best thing we can do as programmers is, is look at each individual film as their as a, as its own entity and uh, and that then the, it comes back to the filmmaker and and so i would i would kind of bring the 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 that kind of question back to the filmmaker it's like what well what's the story you want to tell and uh, and you need to make the the film that you want to make um and you know it, it, and hopefully it, it it's one that we respond to um, we actually have an additional question from Tavali asks, what factors or aspects of a film are you looking for, both in feature and shorts? What's the most common elements uh, for films that are accepted into the festival? It's really hard to say, because if you look at our program, there's no one type of thing that's in, in every film. Um, we're, we're looking for a wide range of of. Yeah, aspects and qualities, um, but I do think that that because we're a, a festival that's focused on discovery, um, and so we we are looking for for freshness and and again, like I said earlier, it's just it's that kind of unique perspective that a filmmaker can bring to a project. Um, and 
So, you know, Adobe's tagline for this year's festival is stories bring us together. And really what that's talking about is both the fact that we're back in person, we are going to be together um, literally, but also just the the idea of um, tying together communities and and sort of the shared human experience. Um, so I'd love to hear some of the, the themes, um, topics that really rose to the surface for this year's festival. Mm-hmm. Well, I think each year our our pro- our program reflects the world. Like it's it's sort of like I think I think all of the films in the program reflect where we are right now. Um, one of the things I think that I noticed looking at the work this year is, especially coming out of the pandemic, uh, you have this sense of like of of this g- grappling of how do we connect again um and and i see that expressed in in interestingly parent child relationships you see that in so many of the films this year you see a uh, father daughter relationships there's a film called fairyland that is is a perfect example of that uh mother daughter relationships quite a few um on the international side, uh, there's a film called Shada about uh, an Iranian mother and daughter in um, in Australia. There's a, a Scottish film called Girl that's about a mother and daughter. Um, it's just it, these these themes kind of struck me as as we were maybe less so when we were watching films, but sort of when you stand back and you see what the program is, you kind of can see a little more clearly. There's another film called uh, Accidental Getaway Driver where it's a, it's almost like a surrogate father-son relationship. So that's how I would answer your question. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting too because what... Um, there's so many different parts of the program of Sundance. And I recognize that when you're talking about the festival, you talk about the program as a whole and sort of how do all the films not just stand alone, but also fit into this bigger program that you have all built. Um, When looking across sort of fiction and nonfiction shorts and uh, uh, feature, are there any specific of those topics that are rising more in nonfiction or fiction or is it sort of across the board, across the different um, sections of the festival? That's a really interesting question. I do think that the films speak to each other, and sort of, and and that this is the exciting part of having an in-person festival, or even even a digital festival, where you start seeing audiences react to the films and the things that they pick up on. And the, and you watch one film, and you see another film, and somehow. You, it, on the surface, it doesn't, uh, it's not apparent, but they are in conversation with, with each other. Um, but I do think that, that there's a, the kind of deliberate way that our program is put together. Um, you know, we have, we have a lot of films that are incredibly serious. <laughs> and we have some really amazing drama. Um, but we also have we also counterbalance that with some lighter fare. You know, we have we have comedies like there's a film called Theater Camp that is, I mean the the title alone kind of says it all. <laughs> um, we have romances. Uh, there's an amazing film called Past Lives, um, and then and then a good old fashioned film that kind of like combines drama and comedy and music, like a film like uh, John Carney's new- newest film called Flora, Flora and Son. So I think that when I, when I look at the entire slate of films, it is, we're always looking to, to balance everything out. And so when you come to the festival, there is, there's something for everybody, uh, but also you can really go on a, an extreme roller coaster ride when you are there. It's not only the altitude that can affect people emotionally. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> that I think altitude and our films, uh, it, it, it's people are going to be very emotional. Plus, being back in person um, and all together watching films on the big screen. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, it's interesting. The the topic of sort of community and connection has come up a number of times, even just in this short amount of time that we've been mm-hmm. talking, both, you know, the the dynamic of being 
at the festival how much conversation and interaction there is in even the most mundane places, you know, standing in line for coffee or on the shuttle or waiting for a movie. Um, But it's also so interesting that those points of connection and topics of connection are about films and these heavy topics a lot of times that become sort of, it opens the door for people to start discussing them. Um, One of the things that is really exciting for me about the festival and the Adobe Sundance Partnership is the Ignite program. And, and really surfacing these younger voices and younger perspectives. Um, for, for those watching, um, since 2015, Adobe and Sundance have partnered on a program called the Ignite Fellowship. And there's also the Ignite uh, ticket holder um, aspect of, of Sundance. But the program really um, services to raise new voices. And, and the, the fellowship itself, um, I'll let you speak to this some, but really encourages folks between the age of 18 and 25 to, to um, get support through mentorship and program opportunities to sort of um, help foster their voices as young filmmakers. Um, From your perspective, what's the biggest impact that these young voices are bringing to indie filmmaking? I mean, the, uh, I think the, the incredible energy that, that these filmmakers bring is, is something that's so unique. Uh, I have to mention one of the Ignite uh, filmmakers, uh, Charlotte Reagan, who is a UK filmmaker, but we showed one of her short films um, uh, called Fry Up when she was an Ignite fellow, and uh, and this year she's world premiering her her film Scrapper that is a part of the World Dramatic Competition. We couldn't be more excited for Charlotte. I, we have I think I think that and this I think speaks to the support that artists get um, from the institute. Um, it's uh, we've known her for such a long time, and seeing her uh, really grow as a filmmaker. Um, just to continue to, um, you know, kind of hone her craft as a with short with the short form, and now with her debut feature, uh, I think. And this, I think, this is such a special film. I think Charlotte's really special, special too. She's such a unique character, uh, um, and I, I just could not be more excited for an Ignite fellow to have this kind of success. Yeah, I mean, Adobe is very excited as well. We love the Ignite program and, and supporting these aspiring filmmakers. Um, and Charlotte, has, though she has, she's the only one with a feature, there's actually two more Ignite um, uh, alumni. Uh, Crystal Caiza with Rest Stop is in the shorts program. And um, Aziz Zoromba uh, directed a short film, Simo, that's also in the shorts program. So congratulations to those young filmmakers. Um, <laughs> Ignite also is is so wonderful. You mentioned that that Charlotte um, is a UK filmmaker, but just the different um, uh, voices that are represented even within the Ignite program. Um, I know you know across the fellows, there's 15 countries. Um, you know, huge diversity, a number of female filmmakers within the fellows. Um, I wanted to bring up that the applications for the 2023 fellowship are still open. So anybody that is interested in applying the um, fellowship applications are uh, uh, being in consideration until February 14th. Um, So I believe somebody from our team is going to drop a link into the chat pod if you'd like to apply for the fellowship. It's a wonderful program and I'm really excited to connect um, at the festival with some of our fellows. We'll be doing some interviews with some of the um, current great, fellows. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I was just mentioning uh, actually the diversity of voices within the Ignite program. But one of the things that I always really love about uh, Sundance is the diversity of voices across the festival and specifically um, Adobe's partnership with Sundance around the Women to Watch Mm -hmm. Uh, at Sundance that we, um, you know, have been in partnership uh, on the uh, women at women at Sundance previously, now Adobe uh, and Sundance Women to Watch Fellowship. Um, Any specific films from this year's festival, female directors that you'd like to call out or, you know, topics that are raised with coming up Mm -hmm. from sort of the female voice? 
Well, I would say the good news is that we have uh, so many films by women and non-binary filmmakers that it's almost impossible for me to, <laughs> to sit here and tell you good. about <laughs> about all of them. But um, you know, I think one of the things that's really exciting for us as as programmers is to see. 11 of the 12 films in our U.S. documentary competition uh, directed by, by female filmmakers. I mean, that, that, that kind of number is incredible. Um, and, you know, while we don't really, we don't, people think, oh, there's a quota that you, you need to reach. But um, for us, I, I think it's a very organic process. And... Uh, we respond to the work. We respond to the perspectives of of that we're seeing through these films, and and I think it just happens in a very organic way that that we have so many that we're responding to so many female filmmakers and what they bring to their work. Um, I guess I should I should mention uh, one of the the uh, filmmakers who I believe is an Adobe was a past Adobe Fellowship um, person uh, was Laura Moss who has a film called Birth Rebirth. Um, this is in our midnight section uh, for people who love midnight films. You're gonna love this one. Um, it's it's kind of this feminist retelling of Frankenstein, um, and it is it's once once you see it, you just cannot forget it. It's such a exhilarating um, and and just film that challenges you on on so many different levels and really rewarding. And not only is Sundance uh, always sort of surfacing these wonderful female voices and as you say non-binary voices within the filmmaking community in the festival, but also could you talk a little bit about the Reframe um, initiative within Women in Film that's sort of promoting gender balance within the film industry? Yeah, and this is this is a an initiative that was uh, developed through Sundance and Women in Film. Um, and it, it's very much focused on, um, you know, sort of uh, looking at women in the industry and um, fig and looking at how to support um, you know female <laughs> female voices as as um, uh, in in this <laughs> as they kind of are navigating just uh, professions and and work in in the film industry um, and and certainly, I think one of the things that is offered is is mentorship. And this is something that I myself is like without a mentor, I would not be where I am. And so I think that is something that is really um, an important aspect to to what Reframe Reframe does. Yeah, it's I love that you brought up mentorship. Uh, we also um, Adobe and um, Sundance partner on the mentorship awards for the in, within the editors community, yeah. um, which is it's an amazing uh, honor for us to to really highlight editors within the community that have taken their time and invested their time to invest in the next generation and not just within um, the perspective of post production and editing, but also life, right? Mm. Like filmmaking and especially indie filmmaking can so often be all consuming. Um, and that a lot of the, the conversations around mentorship that we hear are about life balance and, and finding time for, you know, yourself and mm -hmm. not always giving yourself over to work, um, which I think is really important I uh, agree. for young filmmakers to hear. I agree. I, I think that if, if you don't have to navigate that territory by yourself, uh, you know, on your own for the first time, I think that that is a, <laughs> a huge asset as you, as you look to, uh, you know, building your career. And, um, I, I, I think that that kind of support is so is essential to <laughs> to someone's success. Yeah, it's what's interesting is what surfaced throughout the pandemic are the opportunities to connect in that way, mentorship uh, community that we've talked about, really from these sort of remote perspectives mm -hmm. and how we've figured out. It's a testament to how important it is that we've figured out ways, even when we're not able to be together, to to work and 
and work creatively together and um, find opportunities for mentorship even, you know, while we're very far from each other. Absolutely. And I think that this is my cue to talk about our, our program, uh, Collab, which is, uh, it's, it's an online platform. It, it's, it convenes uh, artists globally and you can access it by, and, and you can access master classes and courses. And it's, it's such a, a wonderful kind of tool for filmmakers, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and also to meet other, other filmmakers who are in, in a similar, similar place. Um, I think it's, the opportunity is, is there on Collab. Awesome. Um, so then I also wanted to talk, we've, we've talked about um, young voices, but also um, sort of new and innovative voices within the next category. That's another place where Adobe partners really closely uh, with Sundance. And can you give a little bit for people that aren't familiar with Next, mm -hmm. what, what Next means within the festival? Yeah. Um, well, thanks to Adobe, Adobe for the support for, for Next. This is a a section of our, our festival that is is near and dear to our hearts. Um, and it's it's the section where that really focuses on innovation and innovation taken in in the broadest terms. I, I think that you can interpret it uh, in so many different ways and you can see that throughout our program. This year we have nine films in this section. Uh, each one is so different to each other. Um, it's, it's, you can see every film in the program and kind of, and then maybe you can under, kind of understand what, uh, what the goal of the, of the section is. Um, but to look at some of the documentaries that we're showing in the festival, they are just experimenting with, you know, with narrative forms. A lot of them are, are very poetic. Um, they're hybrid. Uh, I think this is a very exciting aspect of, of our next section. Um, and then you look at some of the other the, um, fiction films, and they're such incredible, uh, almost like oblique looks at character and, and telling it, how do you tell a story through a character in, in just this creative and unusual way. So I think the, the surprises uh, that that are are uh, that await audiences in our next section. I th I'm very excited for people to see that. And during the during the pandemic, obviously, it became a necessity for filmmakers to be working virtually, remote, connecting remote, collaborating from distance, even if they lived not that far away from each other. Um, we love that we're seeing out of the festival so many films using uh, Adobe Tools, Premiere Pro, After Effects, but also Frame.io, which is our new collaboration um, tools. How have you seen some of the approaches to filmmaking or the way that stories are being told changing or evolving uh, based on the fact that people are having to work in more sort of creative ways of collaborating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our, our filmmakers are certainly the most creative people I know um, and, and really just innovative, I think. I've seen many projects myself on Frame.io, <laughs> um, and uh, I think I think just the ability for filmmakers to just be in different places physically uh, and still be able to do the work they need to do is is such an important aspect of of uh, of the process. Like I've. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a filmmaker and they've just been like, oh, I'm in Hungary working on a project and I'm waiting for my, one of my editors to wake up in, in LA. And I think that that is, uh, it's such a, you know, I think the, however resilient our, our filmmakers are as they, as they, as they've been through the last few years. And I think that, that kind of, um, you know, just bouncing back from a difficult situation and figuring out how to make work just speaks to the, the creativity of, of this community. I'm sure it also has increased the, the diversity of voice and, and stories that are, that are coming through the festival because you think back to a time where people sort of had to be in LA, New York, London, you know, there were, mm -hmm. you had to sort of be geolocated where film was happening 
where now there's a lot more opportunity to include voices, not just, you know, director, uh, screenwriter, cinematographer, but across the board team members um, in different locations and, mm-hmm. and sort of how that affects story and the, the you know, dynamic elements of how stories are told, mm-hmm. I'm sure um, just increases the richness of the films that you all are seeing. I think so too. I think also because of the the international quality of, of the work we're seeing, like you see so many different um, uh, collaborations between different countries and and the, the co-production aspect of of the work we're seeing I think just I think enriches all of these projects you know I think that that and that's something that uh, we're seeing a lot more of it's not just a, a film from a single country it's a mm-hmm. film from <laughs> from many countries in a way now, I want to go back to some of the questions that are coming in. Not surprisingly, Kim, there's a lot about how, what people should do, how they should sit, what they, in order to get into the festival. So we're going to go back to a few of these. Oh, okay. Um, well, when Evelyn asks, um, do you ever get films submitted multiple times? Yes. Um, we know that uh, sometimes it just takes a while to find your film. So we, we are pretty open about films being resubmitted. Um, if That said, I think that if you have a very, very rough cut that you do not feel comfortable with people outside of your team seeing, maybe hold back and submit uh, the following year. Or, or uh, as much as, you know, I, I'm from Sundance, but, <laughs> but there are so many other opportunities for films at other festivals. So... Um, I, th- I just caution filmmakers about submitting their films too early and then uh, and not putting their best foot forward. And so, yeah. But yes, we do. If you find that you, you just needed more time and your film is, is amazing now, by all means, uh, you can submit it again. I'd also just love to, to have you speak about not getting in. Mm. Um, I remember years ago interviewing David Lowry, who has obviously gone on to do many great things, but had um, Ain't Them Bodied Saints in Sundance. Um, And he said that he submitted 12 different films before he actually got (laughs) accepted into the festival, which I was like, wow, like I can imagine that young filmmakers often will submit and not get in and then think, oh, you know, this is the end and maybe I don't need to do this. So I'd love for you just to speak about <laughs> what if you don't get in? <laughs> yeah, I think that that David is a good success story, but I think that there are so many other filmmakers who have that same story um, because I think it just, sometimes it just takes time to find, find yourself as a filmmaker. Um, and the, the this, nobody likes to be rejected from anything. And so... Uh, I certain while I certainly understand the the feeling of of feeling dejected from not getting in, uh, I think the, the it's always important to see the bigger picture. We, from the short film perspective, we get eleven thousand films and sixty five get in. Um, the odds are are not great, you know, <laughs> um, but I think. To just to have confidence in the work that you're doing, continue to submit to us, continue to submit to other film festivals, um, and never give up. Yeah. yeah. There's also um, some really wonderful aspects of the virtual festival this year um, that I'd love for you to speak to. In terms of the reason I bring it up now is the opportunity to sort of network and grow your knowledge of film and the film community and sort of um, that it's not just about watching films, that there's a lot to Sundance um, that that especially young and aspiring filmmakers Mm -hmm. can benefit from. I think I think that's a great point because you know while we we're always concentrating on the films that are getting the big buzz, you know there's so many other nooks and crannies of our program that We've thought a lot about um, starting with the our Beyond Film program. This is uh, these are this is the program that is focused on the discussions, panel discussions, 
Uh, and this year we have an incredible lineup of, of conversations. Uh, we have a, a our, our kind of big showcase panel is called Power of Story. This is uh, focused on intimacy. Um, and um, Barry Jenkins is gonna be on this panel as is Dakota Johnson. Um, and there's gonna be an uh, intimacy coordinator on it. I think it's gonna be a really fascinating conversation not to be missed. Um, and then we have another uh, uh, panel that I'm personally looking forward to, not that I can relate, but it's on burnout. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of, uh, during the pandemic, you know, we all went through some sort of sense of burnout and especially coming out of it. Um, I think that, that there's a lot to process uh, and I'm really looking forward to that conversation, um, which uh, has a, has a uh, Jonathan Majors is part of this conversation, as is uh, cartoonist Adrian Tomine uh, and uh, food critic Ruth Reichel. So there's a lot of offerings uh, in terms of the conversations. We have a wonderful uh, series called Cinema Cafe. There are also conversations with people who are guests of the festival. Um, I think it's, there's a lot to offer. I also have to, to plug our Indie Episodic program. This is, uh, this is, these are our works that uh, focus on series. Um, we have four amazing projects this year. Um, one, kind of the, the I shouldn't say this, but it's kind of the crown jewel of <laughs> where it's, it's called Willie Nelson and Family. It's a four and a half hour look at Willie Nelson. It's gonna be, it's, it's very special. Um, and then uh, a, a project called Poacher. It's looking at um, elephant poachers in India. It's a dramatic series by, oh, by Richie Mehta, who, uh, who did Delhi Crime Story, which was also part of our, our Indie episodic in the past. We have a new series by uh, Xavier Dolan, um, the Canadian bad boy, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, and then a really great series out of Israel called Kanchi. So I'm very excited about these. It's funny when you, the the second project that you were speaking about, I sort of assumed as you started describing it that it was a nonfiction project, mm -hmm. and I've really loved seeing that out of the festival as how sort of melded topics between nonfiction and fiction have mm -hmm. become that there's sort of this um, approach to um, storytelling that is really accepting of more of a documentary or nonfiction voice and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's also some questions around a festival experience from Max. He asks, any advice for first time festival goers? Ooh, there's, there's so many ways to approach um, the festival. I think that it depends on, on what, your, what your goals are, but I do think that the thing that always kind of grounds you is just seeing movies. Um, and the kind of serendipitous uh, interactions that you have after you see a film, like, as you said, like being on the the being in line for a coffee or um, or being on the shuttle, just being in line waiting to go into a, a, a movie theater. I think that those are some of the the richest conversations. And uh, while I have a different uh, experience at the festival. I always like to kind of eavesdrop when I'm, you know, doing my groceries shopping at the Whole Foods or whatever, and hearing people talk about the films and what they are seeing and what they're liking. And, um, and so I think just being open to, um, you know, conversations and people who you might meet wherever, wherever you are, I think those are, that's, that's the way to go. Open-mindedness, in general. Yeah, I will say I feel like a lot of people um, start watching like what's buzzy, what are, what's mm -hmm. everybody talking about, but really my experience is like I've never seen a bad movie. It's like, <laughs> you know, like he opened <laughs> all the different films that, you know, because I, uh, I think oftentimes it's the quieter ones are the ones that aren't getting as much buzz that are really mm -hmm. so impactful and so um, long lasting in terms mm -hmm. of what stick with you. I think that's a amazing point to make, Megan. <laughs> I think 
I think some of the the less uh, talked about films does not mean that they're not good. They're like we worked so hard on putting uh, the entire program together that I think that there's just so much to um, you know, to to wander into and to take chances and go to films that that you might not normally think that you want to see and to and to. To be open to that kind of experience, I think that's what makes a, a festival experience richer. Um, and also going to short films, too. Oh, yeah. I think Very that's such a great... Uh, I always steer people towards seeing short films, especially if you want to see those new voices and to see who are going to be the next, you know, <laughs> Ryan Coogler's and <laughs> Chloe Zhao's, you know. The, there, there are so many people who have been discovered through our... Um, our short film program that uh, I think I think that's just exciting terrain. Now we have one more question from Clarence. Any suggestions or tips when writing your cover letter for your submission to the festival? Oh, interesting question, Clarence. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the cover letter. I think that in the in the past the cover letter has been something that we haven't paid a lot of attention to because the your film speaks for itself. But I do think that um, that we are becoming more like, increasingly interested in a filmmaker's perspective and why did they want to tell a particular this particular story? What is their connection to the the subject matter or to the community, to the work? Um, so I would I would say be as specific and personal as as possible um and um uh yeah that's that's my advice <laughs> but it's good to hear you know like I, I can imagine that some filmmakers think oh this is everything or oh is there anybody ever going to really read this so it's mm -hmm. it i can see how that would be a a sticking point for people once you put all this effort into yeah. the, the thing itself i think that there is no work that you would do on a cover letter that is wasted effort. You know, I think that it, it, you will, it's important in, in apl applying to film festivals, but it also just for your project as you look f forward, you know, you, you, this is a director's statement essentially. Yeah. So, and you'll need that. We actually talk about that a lot at Adobe, that storytelling is really at the heart of everything, right? Like, mm -hmm. yes, filmmaking is storytelling, but also sort of how you present information in your daily life is storytelling and doing that in a way that is, you know, strong and convincing and has a, a clear narrative is, yeah. is just as important if you're pursuing a career in this, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not just about making the film, it's also about finding, you know, audience for the film and... Um, there is another question from, let's see, oh, sorry, from Lockhart. Um, I'm wondering how much emotional instinct plays into your selection of films and how much does a programming team have to compromise? You, you talked a little bit earlier about the, the arguments or the uh -huh. discussions <laughs> that your team has. Uh, I, I think that was a two-part question, or is it? Yeah, so, two, there are two questions. Yeah, so the first, the how much first, does emotional instinct play into your selection mm -hmm. of films, and how much do the teams have to compromise? I think I think there are, are programmers who uh, who respond to work in a very emotional way, and then there are ones that respond to things in a very intellectual way, um, and I think that. At the end of the day, we're, we're marrying both. I mean, personally, when I watch a film and, well, if, if, if I am affected by it emotionally, if I can't stop thinking about it, you know, days after I've seen it, I pay attention to that. Like, it might be something that I think, oh, that probably won't make it in the into the festival, but why am I still thinking about <laughs> it? Um, and, and you trust those instincts, and that's when you are asking other other programmers to watch that film and to see like there's something to this, right? <laughs> um, and so I think that this is the the very collaborative way that we work as a as a team. We check each other's work. We're we're there for each other. Uh, if I don't respond to something, but I know that another programmer might, I make sure that that programmer sees that particular film. 
Um, in, in terms of compromising, you know, I think that we're, we're a group of 13 people. Um, we, my job as director of programming is to hear everybody's perspective, uh, hear the arguments, hear the, the pros and cons, and, and to listen to the, to the passion in the room. And, and generally, that is what, what guides me to make a decision about, about a particular film. Awesome. So uh, we're coming to the end of our conversation here, and I would love um, to finish off with a question um, that I'm sure everyone listening right now is wondering, which is, what are the, the top pieces of advice that you have for young aspiring filmmakers um, as they're heading out on this journey? <laughs> I think I've, I've mentioned this several times, but just making the film that you want to make. I think that that's, that's such an important thing. Like, don't make the film that you think people want to see because ultimately it's your work and this is, this is, your, this is the, your baby that you take out into the world. Um, I also think it's really important to find collaborators, I think, to, to find your community. And this is something that takes a little time, uh, I think, no matter what profession you're in, but I think to find your people. And, and once you find those trusted people, to really, to listen to them and, and to think of them as, as people who are contributing to, uh, to a piece of work, um, I think that's, that is, that, those are important. And also take risks. Um, I think that there's so much that is built on, so much of the Sundance Film Festival is built on uh, you know, filmmakers who have taken risks. And uh, so, yeah, those are my, those are my three <laughs> pieces of advice. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I just want to um, remind everyone that this video or this uh, live stream is going to be available on demand. So you can watch it after the fact to get all those great tidbits that Kim has been giving us. Um, also, for those who are uh, attending Sundance in person or even um, watching virtually, we will have um, a, a filmmakers panel at Sundance on uh, Saturday the 21st. We will be having a panel discussion. So watch our uh, Adobe social channels for more information on that. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Kim, for joining us today and for such a lovely conversation. Thank you, Megan. It was really nice chatting with you. And thank you to the uh, live audience. Stay tuned for more next week from the 2023 Sundance Film Festival.